<clears throat> Only I will have to walk. This back. meeting is being recorded. Thank you. <laughs> Just I have to walk back and forth here. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting. Uh, is that readable or is it too bright here? The light. Uh... <clears throat> yeah. Don't worry about that. I think. Okay. Well. It's very cozy. Either on or off. It's a Boolean, uh, Boolean light. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's a quite dark. But, uh, it's fine. <clears throat> anyway, thanks. Okay, so finally we can start. So what I wanted to talk about is uh, mod stochastic modeling. Uh, of processes that have two kind of uh, particularly difficult features, if you wish. One is uh, higher order and the other one is co-induction. And the motivation for that is that um, co-induction allows us to describe processes that run sort of indefinitely potentially. And many of the, co the, the stochastic processes that people are interested in are of that kind. I mean, the simplest one being uh, Markov processes, but uh, also various others. And then one can combine that also with higher order things. And um, uh, for higher order, there are some uh, applications, for example, uh, uh, images, uh, for example, one can represent as a map from, uh, from uh, the domain that would describe the, the, the layout of the image into the real numbers telling us what the value of uh, the particular place of, of, uh, of an image is. So that's something that became recently quite popular, I learned. Um, but then also the process of learning itself is something where we want we learn a function and this is actually a, a process a potentially infinite process of improvement steps optimization in general these kinds of things they are essentially co-inductive processes that for all practical purposes are often stopped just arbitrarily at some point but there's no need to in fact uh, this is a potentially something that can be observed up to arbitrary depth so that's uh, uh, another potential motivation for this. Let's see if I can So that's the introduction kind of. But so how, how are you gonna do that? And well, the inspiration is actually, you know, the, this typical uh, uh, approach that we combine a language with some kind of uh, effect that we may have in the language. And effects can be non-determinism, it can be probabilities. And uh, then, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Moji has done that uh, uh, using monads, and this is kind of the approach we will be following with this as well to, to, to get an intuition of what to do. And what do you do now with um, co-induction, for example, or generally any form of recursion? And so this is where the guarded recursion comes in. And guarded recursion is something where on the type level, uh, one can control that a program actually does something useful. So we, we have a recursion where we can refer to uh, other uh, parts of the program and uh, uh, introduce a recursion, but to have that in a well-defined way, we need to do something. And so what a guarded recursion offers here is, is a type system that allows us to control recursion and actually get something meaningful, meaningful out of that. And we'll discuss how that works. And so one thing one can get is, uh, uh, co-iteration for co-inductive types, but in fact one can do full domain theory in here. So it's really a, a, a way of setting up domain theory uh, in the, inside the language using a type system. So you can really do fancy things. You can even do uh, heaps that contain uh, information about themselves, uh, probability distributions about, about themselves and this kind of stuff. So you can get really uh, mind-boggling uh, things. But we will stick to simple examples. So originally, this came out of uh, some in, a, in an example in uh, in a paper that I've uh, written on on how to do the regarded recursion more generally. That's this one here. Well, I was mostly interested in logic, but uh, turns out many of these things in generality also work in languages like this nice. So what I will be talking about is uh, I will give you an, uh, an introduction to this language. 
Uh, and then I will talk a bit about the semantics, both the uh, operational and denotational semantics of it. And uh, in fact, this has also been implemented by a student. So here's an example. So uh, I, th I think most of you would know what a stream is, uh, an infinite sequence of values. And so now the classical example of a random walk is actually nothing but that. It's an infinite sequence of steps that uh, you can take. And in this case, we will be focusing on a very stupidly simple thing as just walking on the line. On the line. And so the way that works in this language is that we have a base type of real numbers. Uh, we have a product type, form pairs. And then you see here this funny uh, triangle at the X. And so the, the intent is that this here is going to be a fixed form type. So you have a fix here, and you have a, uh, a variable, uh, and then you can unfold this type. But uh, every time you unfold this type, you will get this triangle. And this triangle is called the later modality. And the intent of this is that uh, to give a value of this type here, we have to give an, a real number. And we have to get an element of this here, which says it's a computation of a sequence that can happen somewhere later, somewhere later in the future. So that's why this is called the latent modality. And this latent modality is what will allow us to control recursion. And I will show you how this is going to work. So since we want to model stochastic processes, we need to have some kind of uh, stochastic behavior. And so I will focus on just one particular one, which is uh, normal distributions. And so, what, so this construction here is something that will give us a real number. It's something of a type real number. But in reality, in the interpretation, it will be a probability distribution over real numbers. And it's going to be a uh, probability distribution when we have uh, a normal distribution with expected value rho and uh, standard deviation sigma. Okay. And now to implement the random walk, what we do is we write a function like this. It's essentially, a, this is a still first order, but it has the co-induction aspect. It has two parameters. The first parameter is something that we will fix kind of standard deviation. So that's not super important. And but the second part is the current position of as to where we are. So it's a kind of accumulator. And what we want to do is we want to generate from this current position where we are, a sequence of random steps that we take, and that these steps we will record in this, uh, in this output, in this sequence of elements. But really what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna construct a probability distribution over all the possible sequences that we're gonna generate from that point on. That's really what this is gonna do. And so here is how somehow we need to have some form of uh, recursion because well we want to do one step and we want to draw where we go and then we continue. Here's a program and I will explain you throughout the talk also what the ingredients to this program are. But I would like to give you already a, a basic idea of how this language works. So what you see here is uh, well the usual lambda abstractions. We get the input that's the, the standard deviation. But then we, are, we have a fixed point construction. So we have fixed F and F is something, that it's a map from R to R omega. So basically this part, this is really what we're interested in when we do the accumulator. But actually its type is changing. Its type now has this later modality put in front of it. And so this is what will uh, do the, the guarded recursion because now we need to make sure that if we want to make an output, what we have to do is we have to produce something of this type without the latent modality, given that we have the, the F with the latent modality on it. And I will show you the rule, uh, the typing rule in a moment. But basically what we have to do, we have to turn something that is guarded with this latent modality into something that doesn't have the latent modality. And this is really where kind of the, the productivity of this program will come from. So where we, we have to do some, uh, some work to actually make an output. And what is it that we're going to do here? Well, we will, we will produce a function now. It takes an x, that's going to be our current position. And then we have to make an, an output. And what we will make as an output is something of this fixed point type that's the in here. So this is kind of, that brings us 
into the into the fixed point. Then a pair, that's this part here, where first we output the current position, that's the x, and then we somehow have to continue doing the next step. And continuing to do the next step is using this, this f here, which is not a function itself, but is a function that we have access to in the future, so to speak, in the next round of uh, recursion. And applying a function in the future is not function application, but it's this function application kind of with a star. And uh, it's uh, what uh, some people will recognize as an applicative functor from Haskell, perhaps. That's basically what this, this does. And now we have to apply this to something uh, of the argument type, but with the later modality around. And so this thing, what we want to, what we will use is next, which just takes a value of R and turns it into something later R, because it's something we have in the future, at that moment we have available and we can then use. And what is this value going to be? Well, we draw from our probability distribution the next position that we're going to. And then we continue. And then this program unfolds, essentially doing the same thing. But in the next step, we will have instead of x, we will have whatever we have drawn here from the, from the probability distribution. And I will show you then, uh, uh, once we have gone through the typing rules, I will show you how this works in uh, operational, the operational semantics. Okay, so this is kind of the, the rough idea. There's basically the ingredients of problem to, to work with uh, 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 probability distributions to draw something here, we have the stochastic behavior, and then this part here, this the later application and the fixed point to do recursion. Uh, all right, so how does this work? And uh, uh, maybe uh, well, another uh, piece of motivation here is that uh, um, you know one can do uh, induction, uh, co-induction using the typical schemes uh, that one has, you know, iteration, uh, co-iteration schemes. They're uh, they're good, but uh, typically when we program, we don't program like that. Instead, we program in a way that we write a set of equations, so to speak, that specify a program. And we use recursion in there. But then the question is, how do you make sure that uh, you don't introduce non-termination? Uh, and that's exactly what the, what the later modality allows us to solve here. Now, let's see how that works. So here, this is the, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the implementation of this has a more elaborate type system, but I will focus just on, on uh, three basic type constructors. Uh, <clears throat> Um, so we have function types, and you see what is also happening here is that we have a context of type variables that are used, and whenever we form the function type, we can actually use these type variables on both sides, and that's fine. We can build a weird recursive types where we have negative uh, uh, or non-strictly positive occurrences of, of type variables as well. Uh, we have product types. And then we have the fixed point type. And so here, the, the, the reason why everything works is this side condition, which says that if you want to form a fixed point type x, then this variable has to be guarded kind of by this later modality. So that means whenever you do an unfolding of this fixed point, somewhere you have to go through this later modality. And because of this condition, uh, everything we do with this fixed point recursion will be well defined. I uh, will talk a bit about how this works. Yes. We have a base type of real numbers. You can add other things, but that's going to be fine for now. Given a type A, we can form later of A, so we can speak the modality somewhere to actually get this condition. And the type variable, we can use it. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I want, when you say appears, what do you mean is actually used under no. modality? That it's syntactically. Used. Yeah, well, if you never use the, the, the variable yeah, I know. And, and you have a constant type where, where you basically have a fixed point variable, if you take a, a fixed point over, but you never use the variable, that's going to be a constant type. So that, that's fine. So it's only syntactically. <clears throat> this is a syntactic. Uh, there's, there's a reason there's a semantic condition that corresponds to this uh, on the functors that you get out of this, but we will discuss. And if you have multiple <coughs> letters, it doesn't matter 
on the wage. You can do uh, you can do many as many as you like. And it also doesn't it doesn't have to work on every if one is enough. So the, it's just that the variable it has to appear under the the, the, the later modality. They can appear under multiple ones. It can appear in several places under under this modality. That's fine. It's just it should never occur just for. It's uh, yeah. <clears throat> and so I mean the uh, one example we have seen already, namely the. Uh, the streams here of natural numbers, uh, sorry, of real numbers. Here's another interesting one, which is uh, uh, partial computations. So the way this works is that uh, I didn't uh, write now when, when we have the plus here, but I mean, uh, the, the implementation of the language has that and also the, uh, the, uh, the, the work of the student might uh, treat that. And in any case, so given a, a fixed type, we want to say, well, we want to make potentially an output in A, but we don't have to, we're not obliged to. And the way this works is that we form a type where we say either we, we output an A or we delay the computation and we do some, somewhere later either an output or maybe never. So these are kind of uh, partial computations. When, whenever you have something of like this uh, process I A, then you may get something in A, but you may also not. And uh, then also in the semantics, you will actually get this probability distributions over those for sure computations. Um, and we will look at some example for that. Uh, there's, for example, the geometric distribution falls. Around this. Okay, now to the terms. Most of these are kind of the, the expected things you would. Uh, Want in the language with, uh, with functions and products, right? So this is your the usual stuff. Right? First and second projection for the product, formula of pairs, lambda abstraction, uh, function application. So there's nothing surprising here. That's exactly what you would expect. Then we have uh, uh, the fixed point type level. Here we have two. We have first of all, given something of that fixed point type, we can observe, yeah. unroll the fixed point. Uh, but also the other way around. So we have the inverse for that as well. So we can go in and out of the fixed point. Um, and then that's what we saw where we did reversion actually. Given the T, this term T, with a, with a variable of the type that we want to construct an element of. But now you have to have the later modality. And here you see that, you know, usually fixed point rules will look something like this. You have an A. You have to produce an A, but here now you have to turn this later A into something of A. And this is what will make everything work uh, nicely. And then to do anything sensible with this uh, this later, there are two more things here. First of all, given something an A, something that is now available, we can turn it into something that is later available in a later time. And here, this is the, the function application in the future that I talked about. If we have a function here from A to B in the future and the value or an element of A in the future, we can also do the application and we get something in B in the future. And pull things back. Uh, variables, as you would expect. And then uh, um, here, <clears throat> for now, I stick to countable things. Or later, the semantics, one would have to extend this also to allow uh, arbitrary real numbers, but that's a bit more hairy. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> in any case, any rational number can be embedded in the term, but real. And then we can draw from the normal distribution, really here with the two parameters for the uh, expected value and the standard deviation. That's what I've shown you. This is the, the, the language, basically. Uh, and as you can see, it, there's nothing really super surprising in the rules here. There's basically the standard stuff that you would expect, uh, standard things for the fixed point. The only difference is the, the later modality and how you deal with this. And then somehow we add the probability distributions to the mix, and that's supposed to give us a real one. The nice thing is, is it does, actually. So that's, now I will show you how the, the how this language works.
Okay, so the semantics basically follows more or less this, this approach that also uh, that many people have taken. I mean, Motley was the first to explain that uh, nicely, how to separate into a deterministic part and then an effectful part. In this case, it's a part that concerns ourselves with, uh, with uh, distributions. There's one more thing here. You see, this is, a, this is a, this is the deterministic reduction relation, this uh, successor symbol. But this index by uh, an n, this n is a natural number. And the intent of that probably comes best out if you look at this rule. The intent is that the next is something that says, well, this is a value that is not available now, but somewhere later. And so typically we want to stop any kind of computations on things that are happening in the future. But sometimes it can be convenient to do so still. But if you just allow that to do to be arbitrary, then you will get a non-terminating uh, uh, computation. So instead, what we do is we say, well, we can compute in the future, but only finitely many steps. And that's exactly what this n says. It says we're allowed to go n times under an x and do a computation there, and uh, but not further than that. You will see in an, in the, in an example in a second why we want that. Um, we have also extended this language with another construction that if, if anyone has heard of the later modality so far, and there are some people here. <laughs> um, there is also a construction where you can uh, box a type, which says that, well, the, the, the later modality you can think of as an approximation. It's a, a sequence that approximates the actual uh, um, Type. And then the box kind of closes it and takes a, a, a limit. Yeah, maybe. That's what it does. And it allows you to, to write more programs. And in fact, then you can also do away with this uh, N. But for to keep the, the talk somewhat elementary, I focus on, on this version of it because it makes it easier to understand. OK, so that's the N. The N allows us to compute N steps somewhere uh, in under delayed computation, but not further than that. And then the remaining deterministic computation is kind of what you would expect. You know, first and second projection do exactly what you would expect. Lambda abstraction and then application gives you beta reduction. Uh, fixed points are unrolled with one thing here, which is to say, well, if we unroll, this computation is not available right now, but it's only going to be later available somewhere in the future. And that actually uh, goes hand in hand with the uh, with the type formation, if you look, uh, if you think back at the um, how the fixed point works here, here we have the later, and we get the value. This thing is of type A. Where if we put the next around, we get something of type later, and that's exactly what we stick in there. And so, in the computation, this will come back, as you will see in a moment. Um, then going in and out of the fixed point does nothing, is what you would expect. And then if we do an application of a function, which is something, a T that is available now, an S that is actually already available now, then we can carry out normal function uh, application and just postpone everything again artificially to the future, kind of. That's how, the, how this application behaves. We will also see that in a second. And then there is a, a failure here, which I haven't talked about yet. Uh, this comes from, uh, from um, the probabilistic part, because sometimes we're, we're not able to draw uh, correct values, so to speak. And we'll see that in a moment. And then computation just fails. And what you can do with this, you can implement hard constraints in, uh, in the language. Um, I haven't given you any constraint on any things where you could do that explicitly, but you can have that explicitly in the language. You can, you can test if something happens, then actually just fail the program. And that allows you to do kind of statistical uh, tests as well. One can also do soft constraints, but also I haven't added that here. And then uh, all the computations can also happen in, in context. So we extend this, this uh, the basic reductions to, to context. Now, let's come to the interesting part, the, the stochastic uh, part. 
how does that work? Well, the way this works is really, uh, it follows the idea of, uh, I guess it was the first, uh, Dexter Cozen came up with that, uh, that probabilistic computations can actually be done deterministically. Uh, and then there's a paper that we have been uh, following to a, to a large extent, uh, uh, Ubu Dalago, Borgström, and other people who have worked on a higher order uh, language, uh, which had no conduction, but it's a higher order uh, under calculus. Really. And the idea is uh, quite simple for the uh, preparation of semantics, in the sense that uh, what a computation does is it gets a list of samples from which we can draw. So while, the, uh, while we're getting along with the computation, we may draw from a, com from a probability distribution, but really what we do is we were given a priori a set or a list of samples, and then we just pick the next sample whenever we need to. Okay. And then uh, the overall computation, uh, oh, sorry, this should have been a W prime change. No, sorry, no, that's correct. So whenever, whenever we have now a, a program T, then we start with a weight that this has been assigned so far. And then we may make computation steps and the weight of this, uh, this, um, uh, this computation changes. And the intent is that what we're computing here is kind of a density function for the, for the, for the computation. And I will show you that uh, a bit later how you write that down explicitly. And um, then we have the, the deterministic computation, which has no probabilistic part. Those we can just carry out. So if we have a computation from T to T prime, well, we just carry that out. This doesn't affect the samples because we don't do any probabilistic computation. The weight also doesn't change because it, uh, we don't, we're not drawing from any uh, distribution. So this, this deterministic part is just lifted. But then we have the, uh, the normal distribution that we haven't talked about. And so what we need for that is we need uh, an implementation of, the, of this distribution as a probability density function, so that's the PDF of the normal distribution. And the intent is, while it gets still the, um, uh, uh, the mean and the deviation, these are the first two, but then we want to sample. And what we want to say is, well, we get a C, this is a sample in our list. So we have a sample C, that's the first element in our list. Now this is the sample we're drawing. So what we need to see now is what is kind of, what is actually the probability that we would ever get this sample. This is where we use the probability density function. We stick that in and we see what is the weight that we get. here. If the weight is non-zero, then this is a valid thing and we can go on. We get a weight that we can use. And so now our computation up to this point has weight W. And so we will multiply now this weight with the weight that we get from this new draw. So because we're sampling one after another, we're basically just multiplying the, uh, the weights to get them the, the density. In there. And then once we have drawn this sample, that's the C, we put that into the context in, in place of the normal distribution that we use as a, as a, as a term. And then from there, we can continue computing. Now, if we get a value that is not possible, I mean, here for the normal distribution, there is not, uh, not much that is not possible. <laughs> There's only one exception, which is if you ask for standard deviation zero, I believe that you may get uh, zero, otherwise this will uh, always return something non-zero. But you can work with other probability distributions. That's why I wanted to have that here. You don't necessarily have to stick to the normal distribution here. Uh, if, if that fails, be uh, something that can never, so it's something that can never be basically uh, in, be drawn, but then we just fail. So that's the, this is where you see the hard uh, constraint. I mean, the computation fails, it has weight zero and you stop. Okay, does that make sense? So these are the two parts, is the deterministic part and the probabilistic part. So let's see how this works in an example. So here's the random walk again. 
with what I've shown you already. And I, I said, well, the random walk here applied to sigma and x0 yields essentially a probability distribution of these streams. And then we want to see how this works. So let's go through this uh, step by step. There are two parts. First of all, there is the uh, deterministic part. So what we have here is we have the, uh, the random walk and we unfold the fixed point with the clouds. Okay, so let's just write out the, the definition, uh, which is the second line. And then we have the fixed point, which unfolds now. It's the F. So we do that. We replace, essentially, well, let me come back. we replace uh, this F here now with, uh, with, uh, with the whole term, which is just the whole uh, random walk term, but it's under, uh, under an X. Right? So this is what you see here. It's next of random walk sigma, and then let's look at that. It's important that we have the next. Then uh, the lambda uh, and the application, the beta reduce in the expected way. <clears throat> then we have the in of the outside here. They cancel out. And then we end up with a uh, pair where the first component is the current place where we are now. And the second part is where we have this, uh, this application in the future. And now we see that we have a next here and the next there. And they come together. And they happily uh, give us the, oops, the application. Give us the application. So we end up with the next on the outside. And we have now the application of this sigma to the normal distribution. That's the, the deterministic one. And now, at this point, we want to draw a new uh, x1 to continue on probability distribution. But really, what we're doing now is we start with, uh, with a set of, with a sample. So suppose we have just one sample C. And we fix the standard deviation to be 1. And we start with uh, weight 1. So really what we want to compute here is, um, uh, so this is what we have just looked at. This was the out of the random walk now specialized to one here. And now we want to look at the second part, which is, uh, so we know what, what the first part will be. The X zero is the current position. So that's not very interesting. We want to see how the computation continues. So that's the second, so the tail of the screen. How does this work? So here's the, 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 the rule, the rules really of the, the small step semantics. So where is this, uh, this term here? Random walk, normal distribution, current weight is one and our list of samples just contains. So what we now do is we, we first here, we have the, you see we have the one. Now we do a computation under the length. We move the next, we lower this to zero. And now we have uh, a context that's the random walk one applied to the normal distribution. And now we can look at the normal distribution. So what happens? Well, we have one sample C, it's this. We have the X zero, that's the expected value. So that's the place around which we're drawing from where we're drawing now. Uh, the standard deviation is just one. And this is our sample. So we get our value from the PDF of the uh, normal distribution. It's uh, non-zero, so it's fine. We draw now the sample, we replace this normal distribution here, and syntactic construction by the sample we have drawn, we update the weight. So it's one times this thing, that's the W there. That's gonna be the weight. We draw, since we have drawn now the sample, we run out of samples and uh, we end up with the end. We put back the next, and then uh, here we have the deterministic computation. And that part is what we have just done here. So this last step. So now you see what has happened is that essentially by observing the tail, what we end up with is this part, the next is a random walk, but we have changed position to C as expected. And we, are, we got this weight W in there from this PDF as, as the density for this particular computation. Okay. 
that's basically how this works operationally. Now you can turn this into something uh, like a proper mathematical model where you need to do some measure theory, which I will not go through now. But the idea is relatively uh, straightforward, but it is a lot of technical work to actually work everything out properly. So what we, what we have is uh, generalized values G. So these can be either values in the way you would expect them to be, right? It's just the numbers. It can be pairs of numbers and uh, lambda abstraction and so forth, the usual thing. And then we define ourselves two functions. Um, first, one function, uh, this O, is the operational semantics of T at a given sample, a list of samples. Yeah? And what we want is, well, we start with weight one in the samples, and we end up with an li empty list of samples. We end the computation there uh, with some weight uh, in some uh, generalized value. And that's what we're going to output. If we don't find that, well, then the computation has failed. It's, uh, yes? Um, is the set of samples always of length n? Uh, no, the n here has a priori nothing to do with the length of uh, the sample. This really has just to do with the nesting of the, uh, of the nexts under, under which we compute. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I also said you to stop. at depth zero, right? Sorry? You could sample twice at depth zero, right? Yes. You yeah, sample yeah. into. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, yes, indeed. And I forgot to say here yeah, the stars, of course, the arbitrary number of reduction steps. Um, and then. Uh, to get actually a density, we also want to go. Oh, sorry, yeah. Is there a special reason why you really want the sample list to be empty at the end? Um, uh, you kind of no a priori how many you're going to need. Is that I, uh, I, I, think, I think for this year in the end, it wouldn't matter if you say, well, it doesn't have to be empty. Because in the end, here you're integrating over of these, these sample, over these traces. Uh, and I think it wouldn't, as they wouldn't contribute any further to the weight, the weight wouldn't change. I think you can just say it could be, a, doesn't have to be empty at the end. Because I'm thinking, I mean, if you have some kind of choice somewhere in your computation, yeah. maybe one of the choices you need one more sample than any other one. Yes. Even the runs. Yeah, but I mean, here, I mean, the computation is entirely deterministic, really. Yeah. So, so, so when, whenever you do this, this, this uh, these computations are deterministic. If you have sufficiently many, I mean, you have to have sufficiently many samples. If you don't have enough samples or uh, this N is too low, then you may have non-confluent uh, computations. But if you have sufficiently many samples and you choose this N to be large enough, then you have a confluent uh, reduction relation and then it uh, doesn't matter. Yeah. That yeah. means that every execution should consume the exact same number of samples. Uh, no, no, no. Because, no. Oh, because there is only one computer. No, no, no. So, no, actually, uh, well, it has to consume, yeah, it has to consume all these S's here. Right? Right. So you can put in different ones, uh, different samples. Uh. So, yeah, I, I still, I still, I mean, for some reason it would make more sense to me when you were in the absolute with some S prime. Yeah, yeah, yeah I so see. Something, that but I, I think something left because you don't really care about. I think it doesn't matter in the end. I think for this this computation in the end, it wouldn't matter. How is n quant? Like, where is n quantified? Uh, There's what, sorry? Where is n quantified uh, in that first? Uh, uh, it's uh, also here for some n. So for some n. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, n has no relationships with the seven. No, 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 indeed. That's another thing. That doesn't help. So my question was, is there, is there intuition we can get from sort of existing approaches like Monte Carlo simulation where you're, you're semantically, you're imagining I've generated yeah. a great list of possible yes, yes. tests and then I'm running the program to compute the yeah, yeah definitely. from the samples as posterior. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, if you want to do a sampling, uh, uh, then this uh, you, you you can use these semantics to do sampling. Probably it will not be very efficient and will probably not give you money much. Uh, but uh, yes. 
principle, principle, uh, conceptually, that's principle yes. If, if you're able to somehow uh, do enough sampling, <laughs> then, <laughs> then yes, indeed. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, so, so so then actually to get the, the density, we then also turn things around. We want to say that we get some uh, value here, and then we look at the weight, and that's what the p is going to give us. So you have to prove, of course, something about this p. Uh, it's not all for free. You have to prove that this is a measurable uh, function. Uh, that's a non-trivial thing. And actually, the way this works is that you have to introduce a metric on the terms uh, and uh, use that uh, to, to, to use a uh, uh, Borel uh, Algebra induced by a metric on the set of terms. So, it's, uh, but uh, I can recommend to have a look also at this paper by uh, Borgström and uh, Uda Lago and uh, other people. <laughs> okay. And it's uh, some order in which they go through all of this in uh, more or less great detail. Okay. And then, so then to actually get out the uh, result, then we integrate over all the possible samples that we put in uh, over the weight, and that tells us how likely it is to get this patient uh, in any of those samples. Um, on the other hand, if we actually want to get the semantics for a set of values instead of you know, instead of looking at the set of traces, that kind of predetermines what you can do. But uh, you also want to know, like, okay, given any set of traces, what can we, what do we get to reach a certain value in in U? Well, then we have to integrate over, uh, over all the possible things that lead, can potentially lead us to these values. So that's uh, that's what we use at this function. Um, so while well, you can also look at this, maybe it's easier to read. It's uh, in, this the, the pre-image. Here is basically we take the the, the um, indicator function, we want to take all those uh, elements such that we reach a, a value in U, and then we multiply that with the corresponding weight, and we integrate over all possible traces S that, that, that give us that. So this is kind of where you would then, where the, the, the uh, inference of a probability distribution would come from the, the Carlo methods. Or, <clears throat> Although this is quite hard, uh, still uh, obvious. Okay. Now, <laughs> uh, I don't know about the time though, because we started quite late, so I don't know how far I should go into this. But I can briefly say something about the, the uh, denotational semantics of this, because the denotational semantics are quite a non-trivial thing, uh, because we have higher order things and other uh, good stuff. And so this brings us to what is called quasi-Borel spaces. Um, the idea being that uh, there is a category of measurable spaces, there are categories of Borel spaces and what have you. The problem is that neither of them is Cartesian closed. Neither of them has all the limits and co-limits we would need. But the category of quasi-Borel spaces does. It's a kind of uh, enlargement of, of uh, let's say the category of measurable spaces. But then it's a non-trivial construction, but so that's why we'll rather not go into much detail here. It was introduced uh, by these uh, great people uh, at the, in the Lix paper, and later they have shown uh, also here in the Popol paper how to do semantics of, uh, of, of recursion in a language. But here uh, I wanted to focus on the Regarded uh, recursion, that's different. Uh, and so, so the expert, we had a course on this at the summer school last year. Oh, perfect. And I don't have to talk much well, about not it. everyone here was at that. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I mean, I will not talk too much, anyways, about this. The, the idea is that we, we move away from having uh, measurable sets to having something where we can talk directly about uh, measures and random uh, variables. That's, uh, so to speak, the idea. So that essentially what it is, it's a pair of a set plus a, a subset of uh, or a set of maps from the real numbers into X. You can think of this as kind of testing, uh, probing from a known, uh, known um, measurable space. It has to have uh, fulfill some conditions, which if it tells you something, this is, a, this is kind of sheaves. 
really. This is what it's uh, kind, of, yes, kind of sheath condition. It's a bit stronger. It's a specific kind of sheath, but uh, that's uh, that's what it is. I will not go too much into this now. <clears throat> but what is important here is that uh, well, we have the maps, of course, of uh, of these quasi Borel spaces, which basically just maps on the underlying carrier that preserve this chosen set. So whenever we map uh, with uh, uh, with post composition, we end up in the, in the set there, and that, that's kind of what one then calls measurable functions there. And they form a category. It's a very convenient category in the sense that it's both complete and co-complete and it's Cartesian closed. So now how much better can you go? Um, great. In fact, it's also quite uh, strongly related to the category of measurable spaces. So, so it tells you that this is the so right, right thing in the sense that you have um, a junction in between them, uh, which makes uh, this one uh, a uh, reflective subcategory of the other. And uh, basically what the L does is it, it turns this here into a, uh, uh, into a sigma algebra. And the R takes the, this is what I said, it takes all these probing maps and makes them the primitives. So that's the high level perspective. And it, nicely enough, this, uh, this category also has a monad P. Uh, which models uh, probability measures. So given a quasi-Borel space, we can look at the, at the quasi-Borel space of all probability measures on it, and this defines a monad. In fact, it's a, it's a strong monad and commutative and so forth. So strong, and then that allows us to, to internalize the, the Kleisley composition, and then allows us to do effective computations. That's really what we're after here. So if we have a <clears throat> computation from X that gives us probabilities on Y, well, we can lift that into a computation of probabilities on X and the probabilities on Y. And in fact, it's strongly related to a known monad, a Giri monad. If you ever heard of that, that's the classical way of modeling uh, probability distributions on the category of measurable spaces. So much about this. Uh, I will uh, skip over this, uh, the, uh, the pitch, selling pitch, and I will, I uh, think, in light of time, I will not talk too much about the interpretation of the of this part, but actually the, the latent modality interpretation of that is rather simple, really, category theoretically speaking. Instead of looking at the kind of closed uh, objects, if you wish, uh, where we have a co-inductive type or something like that, what we look at is chains uh, that approximate the, the type we're after. We have chains here like this, where sigma zero, sigma one, and so forth, they are an object in some underlying category. In our case, it will be quasi-Borel spaces. So each of them is a quasi-Borel space, and they're connected downwards with these morphisms. And now you can think of, for example, the, um, the streams, what this would be, is well, there would be no elements here, and you have one element there, then you have pair here, triples, and so forth. So they grow, essentially, larger and larger. They will never be completed, but the, the, the chain itself encodes the kind of uh, whole thing. And then the morphisms in between, these are, the, uh, these are what are called causal maps, which are basically, in, in, uh, on an abstract level, just maps that go down, making the, the square commute that you would expect. And then the, the later modality is very the simplest thing you can imagine. It just takes uh, the final object, and puts it in the beginning of the sequence, and leaves the rest intact. But what does that do? Well, what it does is now, if you have a map from the later modality to y of sigma, to sigma, so that way, and it actually determines a unique element of sigma by a kind of zigzag uh, diagram. So what you get is now you have a map from here into sigma zero that gives you an element of sigma three. Then from sigma zero, you go into sigma one and gives you an element of sigma one, sigma one to two and so forth. <laughs> Putting all of this together, you eventually get an element in each of them. And that gives you an element in, in the whole sequence. But that's kind of how this encodes recursion. And um, well, I will not uh, 
go too much into the, the nitty gritty details. And now if we write uh, QBS, so the quasi Bauer space with the arrow to the left, that's the category of all these sequences that I've just shown over the quasi Borel space. So effectively it's just a category of functors uh, from uh, index by omega, by finite ordinals reversed in there. So that's basically what it is. And then you can show that you get still a Cartesian closed category and it has, still has all the limits and so forth. That you want. And this is kind of um, it's an encoding of, uh, of causal maps. If you take a sequence tau and a sequence sigma, and they appro approximate some kind of uh, final coalgebra, then such a map, when it comes from, from this category, is really what is called a causal map. A causal map is something where uh, a computation at some point can only use information that has appeared somewhere before, nothing later. Yes. And the usual question was the relationship in this notion of causality and continuity in the domain theoretic. So. Yes, uh, um, that's a good uh, question. And in fact, uh, I'm investigating that with uh, some uh, colleagues. So there's, uh, in fact, we're investigating the, the, the topological notions of uh, continuity. Uh, because you, you know, on the sequences themselves, you can define a metric, uh, which uh, gives you also then a metric on the limit. And then you can use that to define continuity and then you can ask yourself what it means. And it turns out this causality is the same as uh, non-contractive maps. Mm -hmm. So uh, they pre- hmm? Exactly, yes. Yeah. And then you can ask, well, what about others? Uh, and in fact, uh, we, we have an idea of how to deal with, uh, for example, um, uniform continuity. Then it's also a question, what is arbitrary continuity? <laughs> but anyways, that's a side you know, I think. Um, well, so I will not talk about this now. So you can uh, you can basically find the later modality as a, as a functor now here. Uh, you have next being a natural transformation from the identity functor into the later modality. And then you have this funky operation lock, which basically is what we had as a fixed point. It says, given a map from later sigma into sigma produce an element in sigma. That's essentially what it does. And this allows us to interpret all the fixed point uh, things. And then we have the probability monad. I've talked about that already. And we can lift it also to chains. So basically everything happens uh, then on the level of chains instead of uh, uh, quasi Borel spaces directly. And then uh, the semantics uh, can be directly implemented the usual, uh, in the usual way. Basically, uh, uh, we turn a, a type into a functor on this category. The type variables are projections. The later modality becomes this functor, which is a, a functor on the on this category. Fixed points is taking fixed points in there. I haven't talked about that, but it, now the condition that the that the x here appears under later is what makes this thing a so-called locally contractive functor. I don't. I will not go into this, but it basically, it basically tells us that we can take a fixed point. That's what we're talking about. It allows us to real numbers. Uh, this is a constant sequence of real of the, the, the real uh, products become products and functions become functions in that category because it's Cartesian closed. But every function now has a probability as an, a computational effect. And so this is where the probabilities come in. And this is the typical interpretation. It's, uh, you have done it in other people. Uh, we, we now insert the probability monad wherever uh, we have functions. And also on the level of uh, contexts. Uh, contexts. And so here is then the interpretation of terms. <clears throat> so we have two kinds. We have values, basically things that don't do any probabilities. And then we have things that do probabilities. The values here, they are interpreted as maps from the context, from the interpretation of the context gamma, the interpretation of the type in terms. These are general things that can do uh, probabilistic computations. And indeed now they are maps from the interpretation of this context gamma into the 
probability distributions over. And so this is really where the effects, the computational effects happen. And then, uh, well, you write down the usual thing. I will not go into that now. Uh, <clears throat> and basically, you can now see how here the probability monad is uh, used that it's strong to do this application in uh, and uh, the values, there's nothing happening. The normal distribution is basically just take the, the, the density function. All right, uh, what's next? So yeah, then you can do other things. So I've hinted at that already as so geometric distributions as as this kind where you have, uh, where you get uh, possibly non-terminating computations. And then the geometric distribution is basically what it does. It counts uh, uh, coin flips until we get heads. So you draw uh, somewhere uh, here inside the flip, you draw all the distribution, uh, and then either we stop or we continue. And this can continue indefinitely potentially because we never, may never draw heads. But we can we keep on uh, counting. So this is one uh, thing you can interpret the whole probabilistic uh, anti lambda calculus if you wish. Here's how using again a fixed point where we have all the, the three components of the lambda calculus, just uh, basic values, uh, functions, and equation. Uh, um, and then, uh, yeah, I had hinted at that already. So if you want to actually do co-inductive programming, there's one thing that is a bit annoying. There is the, uh, uh, the mo later modality always gets in the way here. You see this uh, later now, if you, if you look, that's the computation we had looked at earlier. And actually the type of it was this uh, later of the stream. Now, actually, we don't always want that. Really what we want is a stream here again. So we continue our computation with a stream, not later stream. And so you would accumulate these, it uh, would get more and more of these. And you can... So the, a way to uh, get out of this uh, is we have seen this index reduction relation to deal with computation under the next, kind of you know, around a bit with this, but really what you want is you want someone want to get rid of this. And so what you can do is for example, extend it with another modality, which tells you, okay, now we have these sequences of, of uh, that approximate streams, but really we can also take the limit and we can do computations on the limit. And you have to think about how to make this work nicely. And there's a way to do so, but it's a bit more technical, so I will not talk about it now. Um, yes, well, then you can think about general effects, computational effects. Um, and so what, what I've shown you is the operational denotation of semantics. Uh, some I, I'm still working on the on the exact relation between the two, so that's not not fully uh, done yet. It's uh, quite tricky, but uh, hopefully soon. Uh, we haven't done any inference, so the implementation that there is, you can use the sampling semantics. You throw samples at it, and it works. But we don't do any inference because I mean higher order stuff, and all of this is quite hard to do. But, uh, there's a uh, recent work on these things. So. We can do something. And I would like to work out of some examples like higher order processes to model learning and this kind of stuff. Which in principle, you can write down in this language, but I haven't done that yet. Uh, and that will be it. Thanks. No questions. Everything answered already during the. There's some people online also clapping, by the way. Mm -hmm. You just ask them directly. I think Matthew has a question. Yeah, I had a question. Maybe you answered it in the last slide. Uh, but uh, are the, the integrals, the integrals that you showed halfway through at the end, uh, before you launched into the, uh, before you mm -hmm. launched into the denotational semantics, are they analytically computable? Or do you have to approximate them? Or uh, I think you have to approximate them in most cases. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so so you can do inference in principle, and there is also is in the same paper. This uh, Boxstrom, uh, Dalago, and other people they they show how to do inference uh, for, for uh, anti lambda calculus. 
so in practice if you were you if you did write a if you were using this then yeah. do you get any guarantees about how uh, you know guarantees about how much error can creep in to your to your um, friend's son or is that completely i think this might be quite hard to estimate i don't know uh so sam staten has worked recently on these kinds of things as well the higher order inference uh, he may have some they, there's this language uh, lazy people it would be very interesting to look at it's, uh, in the church of course i don't know what the guarantees are there and if you open the chat you'll see some discussion there uh -huh. apparently a part has joined uh-huh oh, that's very good I, I want. <laughs> Tell me, what are the guarantees? You're muted, Ohad. I mean, I don't have much to say, right? But can you hear me? On virtual, yes, can hear you now. Right. Yeah, I mean, what you can't get is that if you want to get um, arbitrarily close, then how, how long yeah. you have to compute to guarantee being yeah. close to the result, right? But you get a probability guarantee of okay. probability one. You, you, you will approximate the, the answer. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, indeed. But I don't think this is uh, really what uh, Matthew was asking you about. No, no, he asked about uh, exact, I mean, exactly it's... approximating them, right? And that's in general not, not yeah, possible. Yeah, exactly so approximating Ackerman. Yeah. Ackerman, Roy. I'll put it down. Yeah, yeah. OK, thanks. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Okay. So maybe maybe I still have a question about what I asked about earlier. When we showed the integral, mm -hmm. go to that slide. Yeah. Um, I was thinking that maybe because you have this integral, that it makes sense that you actually end up in epsilon. Um, what do you mean? Because here you're 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 basically trying it out for all the s's, right? To some extent. Yeah, here, yes, yeah. 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 Yeah, so then you might as well say, but it, so if it already works for S, why would you extend it to a bigger S? And yeah, no, that's why, that's why I said it doesn't, I, I don't think it changes the result. In what, that sense, it has no added value here. No, oh, indeed, yes. Maybe. No, no, that, that's what I'm saying. So, so that's what I, maybe I didn't really make that clear. So when you compute this integral here, I think it doesn't matter because they will contribute no uh, other weight to the, to the integral. Right. Well, then they won't because you insist that. But if you don't right. integrate over everything, then it has a ch then of course it changes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, let's share the paper. Okay. Well then. Uh, I don't know. There's no other question. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming.